Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. The Parable of the Sower, and it's part one of our series on all the parables of Jesus. So, if you would please turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to apply the following uh, outline to the parable of the sower. And it's the approach that we're going to use with each of the parables that we take a look at. First, what does it say? Secondly, what does it mean? And I think we can look at the spiritual view as one interpretation of what a parable means as well as a prophetic view of what it of what it means um, and I, I want to make sure that we look at both and not just um, not just look at one but look at both and try to draw some conclusions as far as what does it mean what is the interpretation and also how does it apply how does it apply to me and you so as I've said previously, the parables of Jesus are not uh, nice little stories to try and convey some moral imperative, but they are spiritual illustrations as well as prophetic utterances. And for that reason, they are worth studying in greater depth and greater detail. So it, just to briefly, uh, again, lay out for you the three principles of parabolic interpretation that we follow. And th this is the outline that we are going to use as we approach each of the parables of Jesus. And it's three principles. Actually, it's the same three principles that we use when we are interpreting any scripture, trying to understand the meaning of it. It's translation, interpretation, and application. Translation, interpretation, application, and that is not all that difficult. It simply means what does it say, what does it mean, how does it apply, and to whom does it apply. Now, some things apply to people in other times, but we can also draw a lesson from it that is applicable to our time. So, for that reason, the application is very important. If we don't have application, then it's not practical. If it's not practical, it has no relevance to you and me. Um, and so in that case, the Bible is just a collection of stories, a collection of history, uh, but it really has no relevance to our spiritual life. Well, I don't believe that. I believe that scripture is relevant. And so I believe it does have application, but to properly understand how it applies, we have to know uh, also to whom it applies so that we can either apply it to ourselves or we can observe the lesson in watching it being applied to others or in their failure to apply it to themselves. So application is always interesting, but the basis of it is translation. What does it say? Interpretation. What does it mean? And uh, as, as you can imagine, different people have different ideas about what Scripture says from as a... As a basis, um, I think we most of the translations that we have to work with in English are pretty good. It doesn't mean that they're perfect. It doesn't mean that they have to be perfect. The only thing that's perfect is the original language, which most of us don't speak and most of us don't have access to. But as a beginning, we can at least uh, know what Scripture says. I was reading a, a Facebook post the other day, and it was talking about how um, the devil used an apple to seduce Eve in the Garden of Eden. And they said, this is what the Bible says. Well, that's a problem of translation. They don't even know what the Bible says because the Bible does not say that apple was the fruit that Adam and Eve were tempted with in the Garden. What happened is uh, that person probably saw a cartoon drawing or something of, of an apple tree in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And so they assumed that the Bible says that the fruit was an apple. And uh, that's not what the Bible says. So what does it say? We don't have to dig real deep into it. Uh, 
but we do need to know what it says and what it does not say and not go beyond it and not add to it and not take away from it. Then we can go on to interpretation and what and discover what does it mean and application, how and to whom does it apply. So I, I bring that up so that you can kind of have, have a roadmap for what we are doing with each one of the parables of Jesus. Also, in insofar as a parable is concerned, it's important to understand that not every detail in a parable is supposed to mean something. Parables convey big ideas in simple stories, so don't get lost in the wheeze. Don't get uh, get distracted with the small little details of a parable and think, well, what does this mean, and miss the big idea. It's a big idea in a simple story, so don't make it more complicated than it is. Okay, so we go to the first part. What does it say? And to understand the parable of the sower, let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Now, the parable of the sower is also related in Mark chapter 4, as well as in Luke chapter 8. So this is one of those parables, and there are a few, that appear in three of the four Gospels. Some appear only in two, some appear only in one. But this is one of the parables that appear in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John does not record very many parables uh, for reasons that become clear when we study the book of John. That's not what he is trying to convey. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are teaching books, and these books contain, all three of them contain the parable of the sower. So we could we could read each account in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but we're just going to look at the account in Matthew. Now, it is it is interesting when you get to the explanation that Jesus gives of the parable, you get little details in Mark and in Luke that you don't get in Matthew. So when we go to the interpretation of the parable, uh, it, it will be helpful to look at what Mark and Luke say to support what Matthew says in the interpretation. But as far as the parable itself, it's pretty consistent, almost identical, the way Matthew tells it, the way Mark tells it, the way Luke tells it. It only differs a little bit in the interpretation. And that's fine. We, we can have differences. If, if three people describe something in writing, they're going to describe it a little bit differently based on their perspective uh, but that doesn't mean that they will disagree. It means that they are harmonizing, and that's why we call it the harmony of the Gospels. Uh, so the Scripture doesn't contradict itself, but often our interpretation will contradict it. And so uh, we we get to the first part here, what does it say, and we keep all of that in mind. And it, it would be useful to to look at when something appears more than once to compare and see the differences. Again, that will come into into play as we discuss the interpretation. But first, Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 1, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, so big idea wrapped up in a simple story. The parable of the sower. So let's look at it. Who's the main character here? Well, I think the main character is the sower. The sower who goes out to sow the seed. That's the main character. Now, the sower... In Bible times, or the ones who would go out to sow their seed, uh, they didn't plant seed the way you and I may be used to thinking about planting seeds. If you have a garden and you you make little rows, little mounds of 
dirt and then you dig a hole and you drop three or four little seeds into the hole and then you cover it up again and then you move on to the next and you move on to the next. This type of sowing was conducted by scattering seed, tossing it in the air or throwing it out into the air and letting it fall to the ground. So they didn't go out and plant each individual uh, seed. But they had a bag, they would reach into the bag, grab a handful of seed, and just fling it, toss it, throw it out into the air, to the left, to the right, to the front, to the left, to the right, to the front. And that's how they would sow their their field. Uh, Very simple. It's just a little bit different than what we may be used to picturing. So this explains, I, I, I say that, I share that with you, to explain why it is that some of the seed fell in places that was maybe uh, less than desirable for seeds to be. Um, Simply because they they threw the seed out into the air and some of the seed would go to places that uh, Jesus describes here in the parable. So let's break it down and look. There's four possible outcomes for this seed. So if you diagram this, you can see some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and ate it up. Then there's some seed, he says, that fell on rocky soil, and it withered away. Um, Well, what he's describing with the rocky soil is very thin soil that doesn't give the the plant a chance to have a a very developed root system. So what happens because the the it's just a thin layer of soil and it's very rocky it will spring up and grow very quickly in the beginning and that's what he's talking about it immediately sprang up because it had no depth of earth so that that's an interesting thing that we'll look at in the interpretation but the point is that with the thin layer of soil it immediately sprang up and you, you might say that it grew very very rapidly, looked very successful in terms of growth. But because the soil was thin, it didn't have a chance to develop deep roots, and so when the sun came up, it did not have the depth of growth under the surface to be fruitful and and to remain and to survive the heat, and so it withered away. Well, then some of that seed, a third part of that seed, fell among thorns and was choked out. So the analogy would be something like weeds or thorns. There's something else that's, that's growing together with it that is interfering with its growth, and so uh, it eventually is choked out and is unable to produce fruit. But then he says, some seed fell on good ground, and it produced, it yielded a crop. And some of it yielded a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Thirty, sixty, or one hundredfold. Return. Okay, so that's a very simple story. The question is, what does it mean? And if we diagram it, we have it like this. We have the seed. Some of the seed goes to the wayside. Some falls on the rocks. Some falls among the thorns. Some of it falls in good soil. And even that which falls in the good soil, there's differences. There's 30-fold, which is pretty good. 60 is really good. It's twice as good as 30. And then 100-fold is is just really magnificent. So even the good soil produces different levels of harvest. Okay? So that's a simple diagram just to be able to break this down and see. You have three types of ground that doesn't produce anything, and then you have one type of ground that produces three types of return. Now notice here that it's the same sower, and also notice that it is the same seed. So it's not saying that the sower 
has anything to do with the harvest, and it's not saying that the seed, well, some people just got the bad seed, or, or some ground got the bad seed. No, it, it was the ground. The variable here is the same sower, so the same seed, but the variable, the thing that makes the difference in the outcome, has to do with the ground. It has to do with the soil. So when it fell, when it fell by the wayside, or along the path, or outside of the, of the area of the good ground, off to the side, the birds came and devoured it before it even had a chance to, to take a root. Then there's rocky soil, very thin layer, more rock than soil, we could say. And then there's the thorns, and then there's the good soil. Okay, very simple. Question is, what does it mean? And that's where we come to the second phase of our presentation, and that is the interpretation. So there's the translation. We have a, a, a story from Jesus. The story is very simple. The story is repeated in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. So I can be pretty confident that we've got the right translation and we know what Scripture says. So now... What does it mean? Matthew chapter 13, we're going to skip down to verse 18, and this is where Jesus gives the interpretation of the parable of the sower to his disciples. Now, in between the giving of the parable and the interpretation of the parable, you have that section that we dealt with in the introduction to this series, why Jesus spoke to them in parables, and the reason Again, just to quickly recap, the reason why Jesus is using parables is not to conceal the truth, but to reveal the truth. But the way that the truth is revealed has to take into account the fact that the people's hearts have become hardened. Their ears have become dull of hearing. Their eyes have been shut so that they can't understand or perceive anything. And this kind of explains and sets the stage for the interpretation of the parable. Uh, but the, the point is, the big, the big insight here is that these parables are being revealed to the disciples, and that in these parables, Jesus, it says, I will open my mouth in parables and will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. And they, that's a fulfillment, it says, of Psalm 78 Verse 2. So the point that point being that if Jesus intended to hide the truth, he would not have opened his mouth at all. But the fact that he is teaching the multitude and that he will open his mouth in parables and utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world indicates that he wants to set the people free. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Whomever the Son sets free is free indeed. And that is his mission. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of the devil and to deliver those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So Jesus is teaching the multitude and he's using a parable not to conceal the truth, but to reveal it. But he he has to speak in parables because their hearts have become hardened. And so the purpose of the parable is to open their heart. Again, recall in the Old Testament example of David, when his heart was hardened and he sinned against the Lord and he committed adultery and he committed murder. Nathan the prophet went to David and told him a parable of a, of a man who had no mercy. And David became angry at the story and pronounce judgment on the man in that story. And then the prophet said, well, you are the man. And so God was able to use that parable to soften David's heart and get him to open his eyes and see what he had done. And then David repented and he confessed his sin. And he, he still dealt with the, had to deal with the repercussions of that failure. But the the lesson there is that God used a parable to open his heart, and that's what Jesus is wanting to do here with his parables.
So you have that in the in the meantime, and then we come to verse 18, where Jesus begins to explain the meaning of the parable of the sower. So Matthew 13, 18, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places... This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Well, so this parable is significant because it's it's one of the few where Jesus actually gives the interpretation. Now, the Jewish way of teaching, the rabbinic way of teaching, is they would give the parable and then they would immediately give the interpretation. Now, it's not clear that Jesus did that in every case because we don't have the interpretation written down. It does seem, however, based on the fact that it says that Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, but when he was with his disciples, he explained everything to them. And so my conclusion from that is that unlike other rabbis, Jesus would give the parable, but he did not give the interpretation until he was alone with his disciples. Then he gave the interpretation to his disciples, but those interpretations have not all been written down. So when we have one that's written down, it's very valuable, and it's intended to to help us, to get us started in the right direction. There's something about this parable of the sower being the first one that is foundational to our understanding of all the other subsequent parables. For example, in um, I think it's in Mark, let me check it real quick, Mark chapter 4, where the other parable of the sower is explained. Yes, Mark 4, verse 13. He said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So see, that's an extra little something that Matthew doesn't give us. So in Matthew, he just begins to explain it. In Mark, there's a question. If you don't understand this parable, how are you going to understand all the parables? So that tells me, and it tells us, that there's something foundational about this parable of the sower, that if we, get, if we get the lessons here, it's going to help us with the other parables to follow, not many of which have an interpretation. Now, why would God have the authors of Scripture record some interpretations to the parables, but not all the interpretations? I mean, that would have made life easier, wouldn't it? Then we wouldn't have to do a teaching. We could just look at it, read it, get the answer, just like we are going to do with the parable of the sower. And I've said that there are more than three dozen parables of Jesus. Very few of them have the interpretation, but we know that the rabbinic way is to give the parable and give the interpretation. Why is the interpretation not recorded in Scripture? My suggestion to you is... Because the Lord wants us to seek him and to seek the truth and to study to show ourselves approved and to walk with him in a relationship just like the disciples did and to go to him and get the interpretation. And so even in this teaching that we're doing, I'm going to offer you my best sense and my best interpretation of things, but it is still up to you to go to the Lord and get the interpretation yourself because he wants to open your heart and open your mind through the exercise 
of your understanding and the exercise of the Holy Spirit working with you and through you. Now, we can still do that in this teaching series. As we gather together, as we open God's Word together, the Holy Spirit can teach us and lead us, and that's fine. But I don't want anyone relying upon me to tell you what these things mean. And that's why I encourage you to read in advance and to pray and to study. And as we say, keep a journal. Write down the things that God is showing you and let this time with with everyone else be that time when you come together to get confirmation of what the Lord has been showing you and, and maybe get a few little extra things that you didn't see before. And that's all it should be. It should not be a replacement for you seeking the Lord on your own. And that's the very reason why I believe all of the interpretations are not written, because it's up to us to seek, to ask, to seek, and to knock, and to have the Holy Spirit give us revelation and illumination into the interpretation. So when we do have it, it's it's a blessing, because we can read it and we can see exactly what Jesus intended. So let's take a look. Matthew 13, verse 18. Oh, we've already read it. All right, so let's go to the points. Number one, again, Jesus provides the spiritual interpretation, so there is no doubt, (laughs) which is good. So we're looking at what does this mean spiritually? What does this mean in terms of spiritual truth? And Jesus explains it to us. Now, who is the sower? He explains who, who everyone and everything else is, but he does not explain who the sower is. He just says the sower sows the word, and I would suggest to you that the sower is Jesus himself. Now, I realize that when we teach or when we share, we are also sowing the word, but I think that um, this parable in particular, for reasons that we'll discuss when we get to the prophetic interpretation, I believe that the sower is Jesus. He is the Son of Man. He has come to to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he is teaching them the Word of God. So, the seed, he says, that fell by the wayside represents those who hear but don't understand the Word of God. They hear the message of the kingdom, but they don't understand it. Then the seed that fell on the rocky soil, he says, represents those who have no root. They start out really strong and they start out really uh, joyful. It says that, that they hear the word and immediately they receive it with joy. And yet, they only endure for a little while. And when difficulties come, tribulation or persecution or just ordinary difficulties that come because of the word, immediately, immediately it says, they stumble, they fall, they fall away. And so they wither. Then the seed that fell among thorns, he says, this represents those who hear the word. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke out the word, cares of this world enter in and suffocate the word so that it becomes unfruitful. Maybe they were fruitful for a little while because it says it becomes unfruitful. It kind of implies that they were fruitful for a little while, but they were not able to maintain their fruitfulness. And then the seed that fell in the good ground, Jesus says, represents those who do three things. First, they hear the word. Secondly, they understand it. And third, they produce fruit. Now, the difference is in how much fruit they produce, 30, 60, or 100-fold return. And that's one of those details that you don't have to uh, get very meticulous about. Just understand some people produce more fruit than others. And there's lots of reasons why they may that may be. He doesn't explain the difference. It's just that there are uh, different levels of productivity, different levels of return on that crop. So let's look at it from the prophetic point of view. 
I think that spiritually speaking, we're going to make some observations, but let's look at it and consider it from the prophetic point of view, because I believe that these parables represent prophetic utterances and not, not merely spiritual stories. So perhaps there is a prophetic interpretation of the parable of, of the sower as well. Here's what I want you to consider. If the seven ecclesias in the book of Revelation, we just completed a, a lengthy study of the book of Revelation, and you'll recall in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 are seven messages to seven ecclesias. Your Bible says churches, but I use the word ecclesia. Seven ecclesias in the book of Revelation, and one of the interpretations of that is that these seven ecclesias represent seven distinct periods of church history. Now, if if that's the case, and I'm not saying that it is, I'm just putting this out as a possibility. If those seven ecclesias in the book of Revelation might represent seven distinct periods of church history, might the seven parables of Matthew 13 represent the same thing? What if Jesus is giving us prophetic utterances to tell us, just as the seven ecclesias in Revelation represent seven church ages or seven distinct periods of church history, what if the seven parables, and there are seven parables in Matthew 13, interestingly enough, but what if those seven parables possibly represent seven distinct periods or seasons of the development of the Ecclesia. And because we know the history of that development is it starts out, it, it eventually becomes compromised, and then it becomes institutionalized. And so here we are in what some will call the, the last age of the church or the Laodicean age, which is characterized by lukewarmness, neither cold nor hot. And Jesus says, I will spew you out of my mouth. Well, is it possible that if we have seven parables in Matthew 13, perhaps these seven parables correspond to seven distinct periods of church history? Now, when Jesus is uttering these parables, it's not history. It is prophecy. It's telling you what to expect. Um, that's something for you to consider as we go through and read these different parables. We'll spend some time in Matthew 13 in the next a couple of weeks as we work through all seven of these parables. And it's something I want you to keep in mind to see if we can make a connection there. And um, so that, that will be fun and that will give you something to, to think about as we consider the prophetic interpretation of these parables as well. And if that's true, if there is a prophetic interpretation, then I would probably say that this parable corresponds to the beginning of the ministry of Christ and as well as to the early days of the Ecclesia when the word of God was first proclaimed. So you have Jesus preaching the kingdom of God, telling people to repent because the kingdom of heaven is near. Then in the book of Acts, particularly in uh, Acts chapter 2, they begin to preach the same thing. The Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost and you see the beginning of the Ecclesia. Now, what? Well, I'll come back to that. It's important to understand that the different seed here in Matthew 13, well, I, it, that should say the different soil. Because remember, see, I, I had to catch myself. <laughs> Remember that the sower is the same. The sower sows the word, and the and the word doesn't change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, it says in Hebrews. So the sower is the same. The word of God is the same. Forever his word is settled in heaven. So it's, it's not the, the sower that's changing. It's not the seed that changes. It is the soil. It's different soil. The different soil represents the mixture of people in the early days of the Ecclesia. So a lot of people, they look in church history or they go to the book of Acts and they think that they see this pristine, perfect uh, 
pattern, a, a an example of all that the body of Christ is supposed to be like. And for some reason, they tend to overlook or minimize all of the problems that are recorded in Scripture, but they have this idealistic notion that in the early church days, in the early days of the early ecclesia there in the book of Acts, because the Holy Spirit was filling people and people were being saved, it was just a wonderful, great revival time and everyone was happy. And they forget about things like Ananias and Sapphira, who lied to the Holy Spirit and fell over dead in the midst of them. They forget about the sorcerer who went around claiming to be somebody and doing miracles. They forget about Elamus who wanted to who offered Peter money so that he could get the ability to pass the Holy Spirit on to people. And Peter said, You and your money can perish. You and your money um are or can be are condemned. What do you mean thinking that you could buy the gift of God with money? But you see, they had all kinds of problems in the book of, of uh, First and Second Corinthians. There's a great example of an early ecclesia that was carnal and immature. I mean, we could go on and on. Galatians, the church in Galatia, they were getting religious. Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who called you to follow after another gospel, which really is no other gospel, but you are allowing yourselves to, to follow after... Uh, Jewish rules and regulations, and you're becoming more Jewish than you are disciples of Jesus. In fact, most of the letters were written to correct some kind of a problem. And so my point is that the the different soil in Matthew 13 in the parable of the sower, it represents this mixture of people. We're going to see it even more apparently in the parable of the wheat and the tares. And all of this corresponds to Pentecost and to the harvest of the wheat. It's going to be very evident. So what what you need to keep in mind as we study and as we move forward through these parables is one thing leads to another, and these parables build upon another. So part of the way we look at one parable has to do with how we look at the rest. And so... Again, it's like in the book of Revelation. You you come across something that doesn't make sense until you keep reading further towards the end of the book, and then it begins to make sense, and that educates you as to what the correct interpretation is earlier in the book, but you wouldn't know that until you've read the whole thing. Similarly, as we go through each parable, it becomes more and more clear the more parables we digest, the more parables we study, the more a common theme begins to present itself. Now, it's too early. We can't read one parable and find the theme. But when you add to that the parable of the wheat and the, and the tares, and then you add to that the parable of the mustard seed, then the parable of the leaven, then the parable of the hidden treasure, then the parable of the pearl of great price, then the parable of the dragnet, just those seven parables in Matthew 13 taken together we can begin to see a theme. Something begins to emerge. You can't get that just by reading one parable. You've got to, you've got to add to your understanding these other parables. And what you will find is that truth begins to stack one upon the other, and it's the totality of what Jesus is saying in these parables that helps us to understand what each individual parable means, but we want to look at them collectively. So we study them individually, but we interpret them collectively. We're going to find that thread, that theme, that's going to tie them all together, and it's all going to make sense as we weave this tapestry of things kept secret from the foundation of the world. But one of the first things that we see and that we make note of is that there is a mixture of people hearing the word of God, a mixture of people, good and bad, fruitful and unfruitful, that are part of the ecclesia. 
part of the body of Christ. And by that I mean that there are many who call Jesus Lord, and yet they are not submitted to his lordship. And that is a recurring one of the recurring themes here in these parables of Jesus. It's not the only theme, but it's one theme. So we've looked at what it says. We've looked at two different interpretations, one spiritual that Jesus provide, provides, and then we have speculated about a prophetic interpretation as well. So we come to the third area, and that is application. How does this apply to me and to you? So let's take a look. Well, the first point I would make, number one, the this parable is not contrasting people that are saved versus people that are lost. The religious system tends to look at everything through the lens of believers and unbelievers, saved people and lost people, Christian people and sinners, people going to heaven and people going to hell. That's not what this parable is contrasting. It's contrasting fruitfulness with unfruitfulness. Fruitfulness with unfruitfulness. Or another way to put it is it's contrasting easy believers with true disciples. And I am I am persuaded Not everyone is going to agree with this, but I'm persuaded that a lot of the growth that you saw in the early Ecclesia, in the book of Acts, just like today, when something gets started and people get excited, they join for all the wrong reasons. So I'm not saying that there was not a genuine move of God. There certainly was, but I'm saying that by the time the Ecclesia was emerging from its infancy, it was already being inundated with false teachers, false prophets. Paul talks about false brothers entering in, sneaking in unawares to spy out our liberty in Christ. And that set the stage eventually for the institutionalization of Christianity. And then the the, the gates were open and just anybody could joined the church, and everybody tried to join the church. And um, Christianity was, at that point, institutionalized as a religion in, in Rome. So uh, the point of all of that is to show that there is a mixture, and there will be a mixture, and that there's going to be fruitfulness, and unfruitfulness. And another way to say it is the difference between fruitful and unfruitful. Another way is faithful or unfaithful. Fruitfulness equals faithfulness. If you're faithful to obey what Jesus says to do, then you're going to be fruitful. If you're faithful, you'll be fruitful. But if you're unfaithful, you're going to be unfruitful. So the parable is not contrasting people who are saved versus people who are lost. It's contrasting people who are fruitful versus people who are unfruitful. And we're going, as we add more parables to our study, we're going to see fruitfulness and faithfulness go hand in hand. And we'll also see unfruitfulness and unfaithfulness go hand in hand. And this explains some of the statements Jesus made along the lines that not not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who says to me in that day, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. That's faithfulness. So the second thing I would point out in this early stage with this first parable, is that spiritual growth and fruitfulness is normal and it is healthy. 1 Peter 2.2, it says, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So fruitfulness is just as natural as faithfulness. And faithfulness is a love relationship word. When I use the word faithfulness, I'm not using it in the context of religion. 
I'm not saying be faithful to go to church, be faithful to pay your tithes. That is how religion equates faithfulness. It's diligence to the organization. When I'm talking about faithfulness, I'm talking about a love relationship. And you know what faithfulness is in a marriage, or I hope that you do. You know when you see it and you know when you don't. You know when one spouse has been unfaithful, and you know when your spouse has been faithful, and you know what the expectations are. So faithfulness in your walk with the Lord simply means that you're devoted to the Lord Jesus. That you're not here one day and gone the next. You're not distracted. You're not running around. You're not cheating on the Lord, so to speak. But your relationship, you're faithful in your relationship. Well, faithfulness and fruitfulness go hand in hand. And the point is that when when the sower sows the seed, he expects and wants and desires fruit. He desires a return. And if you receive the seed, you desire a return as well. There's nobody in their right mind who plants seed and doesn't care if it comes up or not. We all want a return on investment. There's not a single person that saves their hard-earned money and puts it into an investment and says, I I don't care if I get any money back out of it or not. I don't even care if I lose the money that I put in. No, you want to get back at least what you put into it and hopefully more than what you put into it. That would be a sound investment. And when you invest seed into the ground, whether it's flowers or fruit, you want to see flowers and fruit come back out. And God is the same way. It's a spiritual law that everyone who is normal and healthy should be growing. So we desire the sincere milk of the word, it says, that we may grow thereby. And that's my biggest pet peeve with organized religion. People don't grow. It's not in the interest of organized religion to help people to grow. Religion wants to keep you dependent upon itself. Dependent upon the preacher, the pastor, the pope, the prophet to tell you, to teach you, to make you be faithful to them. And in doing so, it stunts the spiritual growth of God's people. But we see from the parable of the sower that spiritual growth and fruitfulness, 30, 60, and 100 fold return, that is normal, that is healthy, that is good ground, Jesus says. It's the ones, how do you get that? It's the ones who hear the word, they understand it, and they bear fruit and produce. They do something with the word. They're obedient to the word of God. It's not difficult. It's not complicated. But it is, in fact, the normal Christian life. If you make Jesus Lord, it implies that you're going to do the things that he tells you to do. We're not talking about believing that he's Lord. We're talking about living and behaving as if he is Lord. Big difference between belief and behavior and that there should not be a difference. It should be one and the same. But again, religion has hijacked the relationship. In a relationship, faithfulness is the key component to be faithful to the relationship. And that relationship is going to grow. But if you're not faithful, it's not going to grow. It's going to be stunted and it's going to be dysfunctional. And it may not even survive your unfaithfulness. So spiritual growth and fruitfulness is normal and healthy. The third observation, and I'm I'm giving you practical application. How do you take this and how do you apply these lessons to your life? Well, the third thing is just to make note that there is a spiritual force opposed to the increase of Christ and is actively working against your spiritual growth and maturity. Now, personally, I don't think we are that big of a threat to the devil in and of our own selves. He could not care less what we do, where we go. It is a spiritual force that is opposed to the increase of Christ. It's Christ in you that is the hope of glory, and it is Christ increasing in you that the devil is afraid of. So this spiritual force is opposed to the increase of Christ. And we see the birds of the air come and they snatch up that word before it even has a chance to begin to do anything. And that's exactly what happens with people 
ever learning, Paul says, ever listening to preaching, ever listening to teaching, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. The devil doesn't care if you go to church. The devil doesn't care if you sit and listen to preaching. The devil doesn't care if you sit and listen to me teach every week. So long as you don't begin putting things into practice, so long as it's just a theory, as long as it's just you passively sitting back and listening and you never put anything into practice. The devil does not care about me, doesn't care about you, but he does care about the increase of Christ. And when Christ begins to increase in a person, then there is a spiritual force that you're going to encounter that is actively working against that increase of Christ. And as a result, it is coming against you growing spiritually and and being mature in Christ. So the idea that that you'll get to a point where that's not the case uh, that is that is false information. You're going to be tested. You're going to be tried, and the the spiritual force actively opposed to the increase of Christ is going to challenge you. Not just going to roll over and and just let you grow. It's going to challenge you and try to frustrate you and discourage you. So I'm saying, get used to it and don't let it bother you. Persevere anyway. Now, the other thing that we're going to to note is that tribulation and persecution comes to test you to see whether your roots are shallow or deep. It's natural. Stop worrying about it. Stop, uh, Stop feeling like something's wrong with you every time something goes wrong in your life. When you do the right things, especially when you do the right things, you're going to find that some things are going to to come against you. That's just part of the world that we live in. Shouldn't be surprised by that. It shouldn't blow us away. And we should not stumble and fall just because tribulation or persecution. Another way to put it is difficulty. You're going to have difficulty. It's not easy. I'm saying that's normal. But it's coming to test whether your roots are shallow or deep. And the problem with the with the soil, the rocky soil, is that the shallow soil was not sufficient to support deep roots. Now, these are the people that they're excited and they're praising the Lord one minute and the next day something happens and, oh, they fall all to pieces. Well, we've got to let our roots go down much deeper than that if we want to grow spiritually. And where does the root grow? Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse, I have seven on the board, but six. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. But here's the thing, he says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. See, the further your roots go down deeply into Christ, the more solid and secure you're going to be when difficulties come. If you are blown around like a straw in the wind at every little thing that comes up, all it means is you've got to let your roots go deeply into the Lord Jesus, be rooted and built up in him. And what does he say you have to do? As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Receiving him is the gate. Receiving him is salvation. But walking in him, that's the daily process. That's the discipleship. That's spiritual growth and maturity. It only takes a moment to receive the Lord. But walking in the Lord takes every day, moment by moment. And that's how you are rooted rooted in him, and then built up in him, and then established in the faith so that you are not easily moved. Hallelujah. Well, and then the the other point, if all else fails, if the devil can't steal it, and if he can't discourage you, 
with the difficulties that come. If all else fails, the cares of this world will come in to bother and distract you to the point of unfruitfulness. And you know what? You can resist the devil and you can you can stay strong in difficulties. But where I see people falling over and over again is the cares of this world. The cares of this world. Oh, I'm so busy. Oh, I got all these things going on. I don't have time to pray. Oh, I don't have time to to study the word uh, in, until there's a crisis. And then, oh, I've got to find a place to get back to where I was before in the Lord because I've got this problem that I need solved. Well, that's too late. That's not what spiritual relationship, love relationship is all about. You don't have a relationship and then don't do anything with it until you've got a problem. (laughs) But I'm telling you, that's normal also. The cares of this world are going to come and they are going to distract you to the point of unfruitfulness if you allow it. 2 Corinthians 11.3, I quote it all the time. Paul said to the Corinthians, I'm afraid for you that just as Eve was led astray by the subtlety of the devil, you also will be led astray from the simplicity of Christ. Again, everything here brings us right back around to Christ. Be rooted in him, built up in him, established in him, and don't let the cares of this world come in to bother you, distract you, hinder you. That's what he's saying in Colossians, what I just read in Colossians 2. Beware lest any man hinder you or distract you with philosophy and the traditions of this world. And I'm telling you, religion is the greatest distraction of them all because it gives the appearance that you're doing something for God when it's really just a, another distraction from the simplicity of Christ. So I put religion in, in the cares of the world category as well. So all, the point is, this is normal it's not to be feared. It's not, it's not for you to be intimidated by. It's simply for you to be aware that these things are going to come, but you can overcome them. You can grow. You can produce fruit, and your fruit will remain. If you persevere in Christ, the seed is going to bear 30, 60, and 100-fold return. But the point is, it is the, the fruit belongs to the sower. This is not a recipe for how you can make millions of dollars by giving a a seed faith gift and sowing a seed in somebody's stupid ministry. That's not what this is about. The sower sows the seed. He's the one who gets the reward. So you're you're being fruitful, but your your fruitfulness belongs to the Lord. 30, 60, and 100-fold return. And... um, and that's that's where the blessing is. The blessing is in Christ increasing, Christ coming forth, Christ being seen and magnified and increased and glorified in you as you walk with him on a daily basis. And that's that's the simplicity of what he's talking about here. Praise the Lord. So everyone in the parable of the sower heard and received the word. And you go in and, and you you look in Luke as well as in Mark, and read those interpretations. And you'll find that every one of them, it's not that some people rejected it. No, every one of them heard it and every one of them received it. So they all heard and they all received the word. But the difference is in what they did with the precious seed that they received. So calling Jesus Lord does not necessarily mean you have submitted to his lordship. Maybe you've just submitted to his saviorship. Everybody wants the savior, Jesus, but not everybody wants the Lord, Jesus. Personally, I think they go hand in hand, but again, religion has created a false dichotomy that says you can receive Jesus as your savior, and later on when you get really committed, you can receive Jesus as Lord. (laughs) Well, He's Savior whether you confess him as Savior or not. He's Lord whether you confess him as Lord or not. The proof of his Lordship over you is not what you call him. It is in the obedience to what he says to do. Discipleship is implied within the confession of Lordship. Think about it. If I really confess Jesus as Lord and I really believe that he is Lord, then I'm going to naturally do the things that my Lord commands me to do. So then the question is, well, what is he commanding me to do? And that's where you've got to get into the word 
and let that word begin to grow and produce fruit in you. The master is looking not at the words, but he is looking at the actions. He's looking at the behavior, not the beliefs. Now, it's the same sower, it's the same seed, but different kinds of ground. So the question is, right now, today, are you good, fruitful ground, or are you something else? If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chiprogden.com.